Hello and welcome to this edition of 30 Mechanical Minutes, virtual content for real-time professionals. My name is Doug Picklick. I'm the editor of HPAC Magazine. And today we're going to be talking about plastic piping in commercial applications, specifically pressure piping for plumbing and heating in commercial buildings. First, I'd like to thank our sponsor for today's 30 Mechanical Minutes, and that's IPEX manufacturers of plastic piping, including the AquaRise potable water system piping system for commercial and high building construction. Thank you very much for your support. Also, we'll aim to keep this webinar to 30 minutes, but if you have questions, please do type them into the Q&A tab you'll see at the bottom of your screens, and we'll get to those questions at the end. Also, this webinar will be sent out to attendees in 24 hours and uh, closed captioning will be available on the recording, just so you know. Okay, I'm joined here today by uh, HPAC Magazine contributor, Lance McNevin, who is also the Director of Engineering with the Building and Construction Division of the Plastics Pipe Institute. First, a little background on Lance. Originally from Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, Lance is a professional engineer and a graduate from the University of New Brunswick. He spent over 20 years with Rayal before joining the Plastics Pipe Institute in 2015. The Plastics Pipe Institute is a nonprofit trade association serving North America. In his current role, Lance oversees uh, research projects, education, and advocacy activities related to pressure piping materials, including CPVC, uh, cross-linked polyethylene, or PEX, uh, PERT, PEX Alpex, the PEX aluminum PEX composite, and polypropylene. In his spare time, Lance also serves on technical committees within ASHRAE, uh, CSA, ASPE, ASTM, AWWA, IAPMCMO, ICC, IGSHPA, and RPA, a true alphabet soup of technical and standards committees for our industry. Lance, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Doug. Great introduction. Yeah, some of those acronyms, we actually try to sound them out as words like uh, IAPMO, or IGSPA, um, but uh, yeah, uh, they, uh, they can definitely be a bit of an alphabet soup. So thanks for the introduction. <laughs> well, thank you and thank you for all you do uh, for the industry. Well, we're here to talk about plastic piping uh, and getting onto uh, commercial plastic piping systems, but I just wanted to start, I know my home here in Toronto was built in the 1930s. Um, I have a hydronic heating system with a combination of carbon steel and PEX piping. And for the most part, all the plumbing in my house is now a combination of copper and PEX. So I know in residential applications, we see a lot of plastic pressure piping. But how long has plastic piping been around in both residential and um, getting installed into larger commercial buildings? Hmm. Yeah, well, that's a good, good idea to start with the history first. Um, and believe it or not, plastic pipes were invented before most of us. Um, in fact, a lot of the plastic pipe materials that we still use today were developed way back in the 1940s and 1950s. Um, in the beginning, it was for some underground pipes, but uh, CPVC, a pretty common pipe used for plumbing today and fire protection and other things, it was actually developed in the 1950s. So older than you and I. Um, and the first residential installations of CPVC plumbing pipes, I think was in 1959. Uh, so probably also older than many of the people on the webinar here today. Um, some of the other materials came along later. PEX was first developed in the 1960s and then put into commercial production in 1972 by a couple of different firms in Europe, as I understand it. So that's 50 years ago now. So it's been around quite, quite a while. Um, and even the other materials like uh, uh, polypropylene was first developed in the 1980s in Europe and then introduced to Canada in the 2000s. And PERT also developed in the 1980s in Europe and introduced to Canada about 15 years ago. 
Um, so a lot of these products have been around a lot longer than most people are aware. Uh, there's no real, you know, uh, overnight success stories here. Uh, these things take a long time before they finally get recognized. Um, and for sure, they were used in residential, the smaller diameters, residential construction first, but construction uh, adoption into construction systems is definitely taking place. Okay. okay. Um, but then, you know, sometimes it takes a while for products to get uh, highly recognized and then really adopted into various applications and commercial applications, which is really our focus here today. Um, that's it's definitely a more demanding application, right? Because we're talking about much larger diameters, uh, much bigger buildings, uh, things that are much harder to replace if they fail. So design engineers for commercial buildings, I think tend to be a lot more conservative than maybe uh, the residential builders. And that's probably a good thing uh, to make sure that the products are really well proven out before they uh, start installing them in high rise condos and uh, schools and hospitals and things like that. Um, but now that's that's underway. So a lot of these plastic products, uh, we've seen some commercial pictures here in the screen. A lot of these plastic products have been used in commercial systems for more than 20 years now. Um, and it's really starting to catch on. Okay. Are there can you shine some light maybe on um, the types of commercial buildings where we're seeing um, where, where, where plastic pressure piping is maybe making inroads versus traditional material? Uh, well, of course, really the first applications we saw over here were radiant heating and cooling um, with PEX tubing used in the floors of buildings uh, for heating them and then for cooling them later on. And that started way back in the early 1970s um, in Europe and then uh, in the 1980s in North America. But it was around uh, early, well, some plastics were used in buildings, like I said, CPVC was used inside commercial buildings uh, through the 70s. Um, but then we think of PEX for plumbing, it really started taking off in the, in the 1990s, um, residentially. And then, and then in the early 2000s for a lot of the commercial applications. Okay. All right, well, um... So with, I guess, relatively new building materials, the codes are always being updated. And I'm just wondering how codes are being adopted to accommodate the latest in non-metal pressure piping in commercial building. So plastics in the codes. Well, the good news is the codes have been really adoptive and accepting of materials. Once really kind of the milestone or the gateway to getting a new product adopted into the code seems to be once there's a CSA product standard written um, for that piping material. So within CSA, the Canadian Standards Association, there's a technical committee called the B137 committee wow. that actually prepares and reviews and approves um, all the standards for these plastic pressure pipe materials. And there's more than a dozen, a dozen different materials um, in the pressure pipe world. Some of them are gas pipes, uh, some of them are for underground water, uh, water, but for the ones for plumbing and mechanical, um, the standards actually come from that CSA B137 committee. And so from the codes perspective, uh, and that committee is pretty stringent and takes a very close look at all materials and make sure the standards are written to have very strict requirements for performance, um, standardized dimensions, things like this. So generally the code writers, once they see that a CSA standard has been published for the product, then the code writers generally will uh, accept that product. Um, so if we take a look at the National Plumbing Code of Canada, focusing on plumbing things, um, I did a little bit of research here and uh, well, both CPVC and PEX have been in the National Plumbing Code for as long as I've been around uh, since the 1990s. Um, polypropylene was actually adopted into the National Plumbing Code in 1995, it turns out. So that's 27 years ago now. Uh, the newer materials, the newest of these pipe materials, we call PERT, polyethylene raised temperature. And it was actually adopted into the National Plumbing Code just about a month ago. <laughs> in fact, uh, everybody should be aware that there's actually a new version of the National Plumbing Code just came out on March 25th. Um, the Canadian NPC, and it's actually now available as a free download. Um, you have to search for it or send me an email and I can send you the link, but uh, it's called the 2020 edition of the National Plumbing Code, although it just came out in March. 
but now it also includes PERT as an approved plumbing material. Um, so that applies across the country. And then the other major code for hydronic systems is of course CSA B214. That's the installation code for hydronic heating systems. Uh, that was first published way back in 2002, I think. And it's been updated every five years or so on average to include new materials and new applications and new processes. Um, and all these piping materials that we're showing here in the screen are included in uh, inside B214. Um, okay. And by the way, there is a new edition of CSA B214 that published in January 2021. Um, so for anybody who is a hydronic installer or designer, and you have an old copy of B214, uh, I'll do a plug for them. Uh, okay. <laughs> make sure you go out and get the, new, the, the latest version of B214, the 2021 edition, because it has a lot of new content. Okay. Okay, very good. So if CSA, once it's a CSA standard, it, the codes adopt these plastic pipes uh, readily. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, they have questions. It's not automatic. Mm -hmm. uh, the code committee definitely has its questions and will ask for data and certifications and um, additional information of the products, but it's, it's, it's kind of the key through the gateway, so to speak, uh, to get that CSA standard published. Okay. And then can we just touch upon the different types of plastic piping that are really suitable for the pressure piping applications in commercial settings? Sure, well, uh, all the piping materials that we talk about within our organization at PPI um, and that are shown on the screen here uh, and that you mentioned at the beginning, uh, okay. they're all accepted for both residential and commercial applications. So for the most part, the codes don't generally differentiate uh, if a product is approved for plumbing distribution, it's generally approved for plumbing distribution in both commercial and residential applications. Um, so all of these products can be used for commercial systems. Now, some of them uh, may be not available in the sizes that you need for all the piping. So for instance, uh, PEX tubing, uh, it's widely available. Lots of manufacturers make it up to two inch diameter. Um, but once you get into larger diameters beyond that, it's not readily available here in North America. So you're not going to be seeing six inch uh, PEX headers in a plumbing system in a building um, because it doesn't exist. Nobody is making six inch PEX tubing over here in North America yet. Um, but for the other products shown here like CPVC and polypropylene, uh, those products are actually made in very large diameters from the small diameter, half inch, um, all the way up in some cases up to 24 inch, 30 inch equivalents, and in some cases even larger. So those products really allow themselves to be uh, used pretty much anywhere in a commercial building for plumbing or hydronics. Uh, you can move a lot of water around in a 24 inch pipe compared with a six inch pipe. Sure. Um, and those products are available. So uh, almost no matter the scale of the commercial building, there's a plastic product um, that will uh, that will fit the, fit the needs. Um, okay. And in a lot of cases, what we end up seeing, and you won't see it in these pictures here, but in a lot of cases, what we end up seeing in the field is that people will use uh, the rigid materials like CPVC or polypropylene. And by polypropylene, that, that includes PPR and PPRCT, the two subtypes. Um, and people will use those pipes for a lot of the vertical risers, for plumbing or hydronics, and a lot of the horizontal headers, maybe going down the hallways of an, uh, a school or an apartment building or a condo, uh, because you really don't need flexibility in a riser or a header, uh, but you need big pipes and big volume. But then when it comes to branch off to individual classrooms or bathrooms or apartments or hotel rooms, uh, then they'll switch to one of the flexible, flexible materials like PEX or PERT. So a lot of the buildings today are actually being built with a combination of these materials. Um, they don't have to be. Somebody could do an entire building in CPVC from the small to the large sizes or an entire building in polypropylene from the small to the large sizes. But uh, because they're all included in the codes and they all have the same pressure rating, all these pipes are rated for continuous operation of 100 PSI at 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so they can all do the same job. Um, so in a lot of cases, the installers get to make the choice as to where they want a flexible pipe and where they want a, uh, a rigid pipe. Okay. Well, let's, we were going to talk about the sizing of plastic piping because I've seen some presentations from some plastic pipe manufacturers and there seems to be some real differences there from uh, maybe traditional metal materials. So I'm mm. hoping you can 
uh, shine some light on uh, on the sizing issues when it comes to plastic piping for us? Sure. Um, well, there's actually a couple of different things to talk about under the umbrella of sizing. So I've got a couple of slides here, but the first topic, just to clarify, is what we mean by sizes. Um, just uh, because sometimes people are not quite clear in terms of what is meant by the word tubing versus pipe. Um, you know, we call it all piping, uh, just kind of the generic term, but there actually are dimensional differences between tubing and pipe. Um, so people who are designing or specifying or doing pressure loss calculations or buying it um, need to make sure that they're specifying it correctly. So, so when we say tubing, and, and this is not unique to plastic, actually, this also applies to copper and steel pipes. Uh, but when we say tubing, we mean that the actual outside diameter is an eighth of an inch larger than the nominal size. Uh, so a one inch tube is actually one and an eighth of an inch outside diameter. Uh, and that applies to copper that started with copper and then plastic followed that uh, sizing convention many years ago when we talk about tubing. When we talk about pipe, uh, then we're kind of matching the outside diameter of steel pipe. Um, so there are plastic pipes available and there are plastic tubing available. Um, but there really is a difference too because steel pipes were developed independently, independently of copper tubing and they're a little bit larger. Um, they generally have a thicker wall. That's probably why they have a larger outside diameter. So in the example that we've got here on the screen, we've got a comparison of one inch CTS tubing. That's the blue one, the smaller one. That's uh, literally 1.125 inches outside diameter and then one inch IPS pipe. So they're both one inch, uh, but you can see that the IPS pipe is actually about 15% larger than the CTS tubing. So when people ask for a plastic pipe or a plastic tubing, they really should use the right word to make sure that they get what they're, uh, what they're hoping for. <laughs> okay. So it's getting into the weeds a little bit here, but we just wanna make sure that we clarify that. Um, and then the polypropylene pipes, um, those are all uh, produced in metric. Well, there's actually some produced in North America now, but uh, the standards for the polypropylene pipe pretty much follow the metric dimensions where they were uh, first developed. So most of the polypropylene pipes are gonna be marked or labeled as a metric outside diameter, like a 63 millimeter pipe uh, or a 50 millimeter pipe. That's the literal outside diameter of the pipe. And then in some cases, you'll actually find that people are co-labeling the pipes. So a 50 millimeter pipe might also be marked as a one and a half inch pipe because that's the closest steel uh, size to a 50 millimeter polypropylene. Okay. So. Not to make it too complicated, but yeah, those are generally the three different sizing schemes that are uh, that are used out there. Okay, tubing, piping, sizing. All yep. right. Um, I was I was also a little curious about the differences between piping for plumbing or potable water as opposed to heating applications. Sure. Um, well, in some cases, it's the same pipe. Um, most of the pipes um, have the same temperature and pressure rating, whether it's a heating pipe or a plumbing pipe. Um, they've got the same dimensions, the same thickness. The real, the real difference for plumbing pipes, and I think most people are aware of this if you're, if you're a plumber, um, is you need to make sure that the pipe is literally specifically approved for potable water contact. So uh, there's a standardized testing and certification way of managing this and ensuring this. And the standard is shown on the screen here. It's known as NSF ANSI CAN 61 um, is the name of the standard. And this was first published decades ago. Um, it's been adopted by Standards Council Canada. So it's a standard that's recognized all over the US and Canada um, and around the world. And this is a standard that defines how you actually test a plastic pipe or fitting or valve or even copper, uh, copper pipes, fittings and valves for potable water safety uh, to make sure that those products are actually safe for conveying drinking water. And it's incredibly rigorous. The manufacturers who make potable water products go through uh, extensive testing every year in their products. The products have to be retested and recertified every year uh, to make sure that nothing has changed, to make sure that they remain safe. Um, and then they're marked. Uh, they're marked with the term potable tubing, or in some cases you'll see them marked with this standard designation. NSF ANSI CAN 61 might be marked right on the product itself to indicate that it's been 
tested and certified for potable water. Okay. Actually, maybe we should get back to the sizing of the pipes and maybe you can explain a little bit about how designers of commercial piping systems um, can size their plastic pipes correctly. Sure, let me skip over a couple of things here. So when it comes to, uh, and I've got some slides on this too. Okay. <laughs> on the pressure loss calculation side of things. So when it comes to uh, sizing a pipe, uh, for sure, if it's, if it's plumbing, there's all kinds of tables and charts out there and guides, some rules of thumb. Um, but generally we don't recommend following rules of thumb. Uh, the math is readily available. So here's kind of the process that we recommend for a designer to use when sizing the pipe correctly. Uh, number one, you need to know your required flow rate. So whether that's gallons per minute or liters per minute, uh, whether it's plumbing or fire protection or hydronics, you need to know how much fluid are you trying to convey through that pipe. So hopefully you've got that calculated correctly. Um, and then to do the math and the calculations, you need to know what is the exact fluid. Uh, in plumbing, obviously it's water. If it's hydronics, it might be uh, water with a glycol mix. And a glycol mix would change uh, heat capacity and viscosity and things like that. So you need to know that so that you use the right data. Um, the fluid temperature, if it's a cold water system versus a hot water system, uh, domestic plumbing versus commercial plumbing, uh, the temperature of the water makes a huge difference in viscosity. So you have to get that accurate to be able to measure pressure loss correctly through the pipes. And then of course your pipe type, um, because every pipe has slightly different dimensions, the same outside diameter, but the wall thickness might be a little different. And that controls the inside diameter, uh, which controls the pressure loss a lot. And then of course the pipe length and then any fittings. So once a designer gathers all that information, um, then you have to go through the math to calculate the pressure loss. And then there's also the concern of calculating the velocity because you don't wanna have systems that are running at excessive velocities. Um, and in some cases that could be a problem. Uh, and then in some cases, and we'll get into this later if we have time, uh, we actually calculate something called a Reynolds number to predict whether or not the fluid flow through the pipe is turbulent or laminar. Okay, uh, well, I, I know you, at, at, the, at, the, at the Institute, you've got some guidance tools, I know that can be used for assisting and designing these systems. So yeah. maybe you can. So let me show you really quick. Well, okay. basically the, the, the classic equation that's used for these pressure loss um, calculations is called the darcy Weisbach equation. And it takes all of these factors into account um, you can do this on a calculator or on a pencil uh, with a pencil and paper, but generally today people want to use software for this. So we actually have a very good online calculator from PPI called the Plastic Pipe Design Calculator. Uh, this is a screenshot of it here. Uh, it was launched in 2015, uh, but went through some major updates in 2021. So we're kind of excited to reintroduce it to everybody with the new updates. Um, just go to plasticpipecalculator.com. It's an online tool, so you don't have to download it and it's free. You don't have to register, so anybody can do it anytime. And it does a bunch of different functions, but the pressure head loss is kind of the main function that people are using it for. So I've got a bit of an example here with a couple of screenshots. Uh, the first thing you get to pick is what pipe type you're gonna be using. So you can select all the materials that we've talked about here today, um, just from a drop down menu. So there you see your pipe options, and then you get to select uh, what sizing system you're using, whether it's copper tube size or iron pipe size or a metric pipe. In this example here, it's a polypropylene pipe in the metric dimensions. Then you select the wall type, and that means how thick the wall is. So we're going to go with SDR11 in this example. And then you kind of estimate what diameter might be the right diameter. So in this case, we're going to start with a 63 millimeter pipe. Uh, after you select that, then you enter in your fluid information. So that starts with the flow rate, how many gallons a minute you're trying to move through this pipe, how long the pipe is, what the fluid is. Uh, in this example, it's gonna be a hydronic system. So we're showing that we've selected a 10% polypropylene glycol water mixture, and then the average fluid temperature. So in this case, we've entered 125 degrees because it's gonna be a, a hydronic system. Um, and then you can enter fittings. If you have individual fittings in the line, and you probably would, you can enter in all the fittings and the equivalent lengths of pressure loss through those various fittings. Uh, that part you have to enter manually. And then you hit the calculate button and it'll just pop up on the screen. Um, here's the results for this example I just went through really quickly there. So in this example with uh, 55 gallons a minute through 200 and 
30 feet of pipe, uh, 63 millimeter polypropylene pipe. It works out to 5.9 PSI of pressure loss, which is equivalent to 13.7 uh, feet of head loss. And then the velocity is shown as 5.6 feet per second, which is not a problem uh, for polypropylene pipe. So, uh, so it's a pretty good tool. And then if, if this pressure loss came back and it was you know 78 PSI, way too high, you can just scroll back up to the top of the program and put in a different pipe diameter and just keep playing with your uh, selections until you come up with a design that looks good. Okay. So yeah, it's a pretty nice online tool. And then the results, uh, you can print the results or email the results or save them however you'd like to, uh, to deal with them. So pressure loss is kind of, uh, and velocity are the two main factors we wanna, we wanna be sizing for. Um, if we have a couple more minutes, so I'm just gonna kind of dive into a different topic and go a little bit deeper in this, if that's okay. Yeah, no, we've got a, a bit of time and then a couple of questions. So this is perfect. Okay. So yeah, for most of our uh, water conveying applications, we're really focused a lot on pressure loss and velocity. So for those applications shown here, that would be the main thing we'd want to look at. Um, and the designer has all these choices, right? The designer wants to keep friction low to reduce pumping costs to save energy, keep the velocity low to keep noise and vibration down, but you also need to keep the moving uh, the, the potable water fluid moving fast enough to prevent any stagnation of water and decay of disinfectants. So you don't want a lot of stagnant old water in a plumbing system in a building. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to oversize pipes because um, that costs more money too. So the designers have to do a lot of iterative design back and forth to come up with uh, the factors that are just right. Um, but in hydronic applications, there's also the other thing thrown in and if, if it's a type of hydronic pipe where we're actually trying to transfer heat through the wall of the pipe, like with radiant heating pipe in the floor or snow and ice melting tubing outside in the concrete, or even geothermal pipe in the ground, in those cases, we're not just trying to move the water through the pipe, we're trying to keep the water moving in a way that we can actually transfer heat through the pipe wall very well. So in a lot of cases, we also have to make sure that we have at least a certain minimum fluid velocity so that we have turbulent flow. So those goals that we looked at a second ago for a plumbing system, um, they don't all apply to hydronic piping. We don't care about noise and vibration because the pipes are in the ground or in concrete. We don't care about water stagnation because it's not potable water, but we have to care about moving the water fast enough so we get good heat transfer through the pipe wall. And there's a, a graphic here. Um, sure, everybody's heard of laminar flow and turbulent flow. In this graphic here, this illustration, uh, this is kind of showing laminar flow, where you've got nice, smooth, parallel drops of water moving through the pipe. Um, that's fine for plumbing. That's not a great thing for hydronic heating, where you're trying to transfer heat through the wall. So in hydronic systems, where you're trying to transfer the heat through the wall, you actually want turbulent flow. You want the wa water moving fast enough so that it's always mixing and you don't get any uh, slow-moving boundary layers of water in the inside of the pipe wall. So with the calculator that we looked at, um, there's something you can calculate called a Reynolds number for each flow situation. And with a calculator that we looked at, it also tells you uh, if your flow regime is going to be turbulent or laminar. So in this example here that we did a second ago, it also shows at the top that this is a turbulent flow situation, which is actually what you want for a system where you're transferring heat through the pipe wall. That's based on that Reynolds number? Exactly. The Reynolds number is what gives you that calculation. If your Reynolds number is below 2300, you probably have laminar flow. If your Reynolds number is higher than that, you probably have uh, turbulent flow. And the higher the Reynolds number is, uh, the more sure you are that you're going to have turbulent flow inside that pipe. OK. That's so it's getting awesome. into the weeds a bit, but these are some of yeah. the uh, factors that designers really should be thinking about when sizing pipes to just, you know, it's kind of like a Goldilocks thing. Uh, you don't want it too much. You don't want it too little. You have to find that middle ground and find the just right perfect pipe. There's always an optimal pipe size for a situation, but it might take, take a little work to, to get there. Okay. Okay. That's, that's great. I think that's answered some questions actually for me and uh, hopefully for our audience as well. Um, I do have uh, a question here from... Uh, one of our watchers, Claude, who um, as I'm familiar with, with the magazine from the city of Montreal. 
And Claude's asking why PVC is not part of the list of pipe materials. We use lots of PVC for the brine circuits in our skating rinks. Hmm, uh, great question. So, um, well, the main reason we didn't talk about that today is because for hot and cold water plumbing in buildings, uh, we're not gonna be using PVC there um, or for hydronic applications. Uh, we're not gonna be using PVC there because it's not rated for the higher water temperatures. So PVC is a great pipe material, um, but more for colder water applications like brine solution in a rink. Obviously that's uh, it's a great material for that. Um, but that's why we didn't talk about that today, simply because we were focused more on hot and cold water plumbing and uh, hydronic heating applications right. in today's conversation. Okay, Claude, I hope that answers your question. We also have an answer from Gilles who um, is asking about what about transitional flow for heat transfer? So transitional flow, that's kind of in the regime between laminar flow and turbulent flow. <laughs> so there's a certain Reynolds number. Uh, if you calculated a Reynolds number around 2,400 or something, that would probably be in the transitional flow regime, in which case you would probably get decent heat transfer through the pipe wall, um, but maybe not quite as good as pure turbulent flow. So this is getting kind of academic um, in this conversation right now, because you know when you're talking about radiant heating in a floor, um, yeah. We've got really small diameter tubing, which encourages more churning, more turbulence, and we have a lot of turns. Every time the water comes to one of those 180 degree bends in a floor heating system, that's kind of mixing up the water and allowing it to mix up inside the pipe and breaking up laminar flow. So um, inside CSA B214, which I mentioned before, there is an Annex D, which is all about uh, overcoming minimum flow rates to prevent laminar flow to prevent situations where you won't get good heat transfer. It, it doesn't happen very often that this is a problem. Um, in most of our radiant and snow melt systems, we are getting good heat transfer, even if people didn't design it that way, it's just happening, it's working out fortunately correctly. Um, but we just want people to be aware that there is a opportunity if, slow, if flow is too slow, that uh, maybe the heat just stays trapped, trapped inside the pipe and they wouldn't be getting the heat out of the pipe. Right. Okay, Jeff is asking, would you please advise how to calculate friction loss at plastic pipe fittings? Is that? So in the example I went through, I kind of skipped over that. I put in a list of fittings and their equivalent length of loss. Um, and it has to be tested on a case by case basis. So each type of fitting, whether it's a CPVC fitting, a T or an elbow or a coupling or a polypropylene fitting or a PEX fitting, um, each of them basically have to be tested one by one uh, by a laboratory to determine the equivalent length of pressure loss through that fitting. So if I was a manufacturer and I made polypropylene systems and I had couplings and elbows and things like that, um, I would probably have to send my fittings off to a laboratory and they would uh, pass different flow rates through my elbow, for example. And they, the data might show that the fluid flow passing through my 90 degree elbow is equivalent to three foot of pipe length. Um, that's what these equivalent lengths mean. Or if I had a coupling in the middle of the pipe, maybe as the fluid passes through the coupling, that's equivalent to the fluid passing through two feet of pipe length. That's what these numbers mean on the, this example table here. But there's no real mathematical way of doing that. As far as I know, the only way to come up with those values is they actually have to be tested in a lab. So many of the pipe manufacturers actually have had that data collected in the laboratory and will uh, publish that, that data in a table or a, a guidebook or something. Okay. Um, this is a little bit off, but uh, Adam is asking if you can speak to the flame spread in smoke generation values for these materials for use in non-combustible buildings. Is that? It's, well, we can, and it's a, not a super quick answer. Right. So there is, there is requirements in the Canadian building code uh, that any products that are combustible when installed in, let's say, return air plenums um, above a ceiling in a building, where the return air is collected, that the products up there be tested to flame and smoke spread according to a CAN ULC test method to make sure that the flame spread and the smoke spread is not too much. 
that it's below a threshold. Um, I'm not going to get into all the details of the numbers right here and now. I could explain it to them individually, but okay. uh, each each pipe and tubing manufacturer has to submit their products to a laboratory. Sorry, not not on the fitting side, but each pipe and tubing manufacturer has to submit their products to a laboratory and actually have that test performed. Um, and there's a can ULC test method that they uh, test the pipes to where they literally set the pipe on fire at one end uh, with constant flame trying to set the pipe on fire and they measure quickly through this big long tunnel. They measure how quickly the flame works its way through the tunnel, how quickly the pipe catches fire and how much smoke is given off as, as the pipe burns. Um, so all the plastic products that we talked about here today can meet those requirements. Uh, each manufacturer has to do that testing on their own. So if you're doing commercial construction, you can't just pick up any piece of PEX or any piece of CPVC and assume it's certified. You actually have to ask that manufacturer for their certification documents from the test lab to make sure that that exact product has been tested and certified for flame and smoke spread. Okay. We're getting close to the end. We've gone just over our, our half hour, but I do want to uh, get to maybe two more questions here quickly. Is there a graph of selection of pipe diameter with coordinates, flow rate, and flow velocity? Not, well, there's a few of them out there and some plumbing codes um, have some of those graphs in them where you basically match up flow rate and diameter and pressure loss on a graph. Uh, PPI doesn't publish that. We have this calculator instead. So instead of trying to read it off a graph, you can just type in the exact numbers you want and, and get the exact answer. Um, but some of that data does exist in the back of codes. I'm pretty sure the IMO Uniform Plumbing Code has tables like that for CPVC and PEX and copper in it. Um, and actually PPI is actually funding a research project right now at a laboratory in Maryland where we are uh, actually measuring the pressure loss through all the different plastic pipe materials we're talking about here today at different flow rates and different diameters and different temperatures. And that data is gonna take probably most of this year to get calculated. It's underway, but we're doing about 800 individual tests um, over the next months. And when all that data comes out, we can publish that as graphs and we intend to, it'll be published in a PPI technical report with those types of graphs in there for, uh, for the plastic pipe materials. Okay. But, but for now, we can just use the calculator and you can almost generate your own graph um, by coming up with three or four different points. Okay, well, we look forward to that. Uh, here's one final question. Is there a restriction on chemical treatment? I guess that has to do with our use, use of plastic piping in commercial buildings. Um, so yeah, there should be uh, on anything. People have to look into things like that. So if it's uh, whether it's potable water being treated for disinfectants or hydronic water being treated with corrosion inhibitors to protect boilers and things like that, um, that data is available. And in fact, this, this slide on the screen right now is just a little bit of information about the type of information that we have within PPI. Um, there's a specific report that is published by PPI called Technical Report 19, PPI TR19. And that lists uh, the chemical resistance of about 600 different chemicals against all the different type of plastic pipe materials that we talked here. Uh, plus also it has ABS and PVC and some other piping materials in there as well. Um, so if there is a specific water additives that is a, is a concern, you could actually uh, just Google PPI TR19. It'll come up, it's free, um, and try to match up the chemical with the pipe uh, material. And hopefully the information is in there. If not, they would have to ask the pipe manufacturer and find out if right. their pipe is approved for that exact chemical. Okay. That always seems to be a solution. I always check with your manufacturer. Uh, always, um, yep. When you're selecting these materials. Okay, Lance, thank you very much for participating in today's 30 Mechanical Minutes. We did go a bit over time, but hopefully everyone's enjoyed what we've had to talk about today. I know I've learned a lot. Um, thank you again to our sponsor for today's 30 Mechanical Minutes, and that's IPEX. Your support is greatly appreciated. 
For more information on IPEX, visit IPEXNA.com, I-P-E-X-N-A.com. And of course, thank you to everyone who joined us on this webinar today. A recording of this session will be available on our website, hpacmag.com, in the days ahead. And um, for all attendees that registered um, within 24 hours, you will receive a copy of this um, video. And as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, it does include closed captioning. And you can also see past episodes of 30 Mechanical Minutes webinars we've held under the Tech Pulse section of our HPAC mag.com website and on our YouTube channel. Okay, that's everything for today. Lance, again, thank you, everyone. Until next time, thank you so much for joining us here on 30 Mechanical Minutes. My pleasure. Thank you, Doug. <laughs>